Welcome everyone to the first of our data dispatch series at the Center for Data and Computing at the University of Chicago. Um, this is the first of our talks in this, in this series this spring. Uh, we are planning to do several of these. Uh, part of our goal for this series is to uh, keep our community uh, alive and, and going uh, throughout the spring quarter as, as we're all sort of working and, and convening remotely here. Um, so stay tuned for, for more of these as, as the spring progresses. Um, the other goal that we have for the series, of course, is to hear about all the exciting work that our seed grant projects are, are doing uh, over the course of, of, of the past year. And uh, to that effect, we're going to have a very exciting talk uh, today from, from our speakers, um, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, finally, I'll just mention that if, if this particular type of work is interesting to you, in particular the style of work that CDAC tries to catalyze is these interdisciplinary projects that are joint across uh, computer science and statistics, machine learning, and some other domain. Uh, and so if that kind of cross-disciplinary work uh, is interesting to you, uh, I'd encourage you to look at our website. There are more than 20 projects and more than 50 PIs across the University of Chicago who are involved in these types of projects. And if you're interested in getting involved, I encourage you to reach out and, and contact us at cdac.uchicago.edu. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our, our speakers today. Today we have... Um, really exciting project that um, I guess I can only characterize as, as OCR uh, for ancient uh, cuneiform. Um, and our speakers are gonna tell us a lot more about exactly what that means and, and the specific challenges that that entails in this context. And today we have speaking to us Sanjay Krishnan, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Chicago and Miller Prosser, who's a research data, database specialist at the Oriental Institute. So we're very excited to hear about this work today and please take it away, Miller and Sanjay. Hi everybody, my name is Miller Prosser. Uh, as Nick said, I'm a researcher at the Ochre Data Service at the Oriental Institute, where I pursue the nexus of ancient and digital and my academic background is in the languages and cultures of the ancient Near East. So I'll begin the talk today by describing the ancient texts that we're deciphering and how we realize they might be a good subject for machine learning. Then I'll turn it over to our partner, Dr. Sanjay Krishnan, to discuss the machine learning component of this project. And first of all, I'd like to thank CDAC for funding the DeepScribe project. We're very grateful for your support and also for hosting this event, so thanks a lot. So the question we have is, would it be possible for a computer to read an ancient cuneiform tablet? That's the question that the DeepScribe project is asking. Cuneiform writing is accomplished by impressing a writing implement called a stylus into a piece of moist clay. With each impression, the stylus leaves a single wedge. The scribe records a pattern of wedges to create a single sign. As such, the writing is inherently three-dimensional, a fact that introduces challenges for artificial intelligence. It's not that the depth of the wedges changes the meaning of the sign, but rather that the tablet can be best read under certain lighting conditions that cast just the right amount of shadow on the wedges. With the tablet in hand, it's no problem to rotate the object to change the nature of the shadows in the wedges. However, a simple digital photograph is not dynamic, so the machine learning algorithm is left with only one static view of the cuneiform sign. Why would it be valuable for a computer to read a tablet like this, and what would that even mean? At this point, we don't expect a computer to read, translate, and interpret the ancient document. However, we'd like to ask the computer to perform the most tedious and repetitive work. Uh, for a specialist to read this tablet, ideally they'd sit down with the tablet in hand and possibly with a set of high resolution images. Then they would copy 
sign by sign or word by word the values represented by the cuneiform wedges. Then they would do this again for the other 10,000 documents in the text corpus, and this process could take a lifetime. As it turns out, documents like this one are highly repetitive, using the same words over and over and talking about the same topics over and over. As such, even if the computer cannot fully interpret the text, one would hope that it could successfully identify 90% of the text, leaving only the difficult parts for the scholar. So let's talk about these tablets, where they came from, and how they became digital data. In March 1933, archaeologists from the Oriental Institute, excavating the site of Persepolis, discovered a large cache of business documents dating to roughly 500 BCE. This grand site was the location of the palace of the great kings Darius and Xerxes and their Achaemenid predecessors. The documents, numbering some 10,000, are written mostly in the Elamite language using a cuneiform script, although a small subset is written in Aramaic. They were found in two small rooms in a fortification wall near the edge of the great stone terrace. Taken as a whole, the corpus of texts records the administrative workings of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. As individual documents, they may seem quite boring and narrowly focused, but taken as an entire unit, they provide an important historical witness to this empire. I like to use the rather imprecise comparison to a filing cabinet of Walmart receipts. Any given receipt has limited value, but a year's worth of receipts may give you some insight into the business of Walmart. These clay tablets are something like the accounting documents of this empire. Scholars at the Oriental Institute have studied these tablets on loan from the Republic of Iran on and off since their discovery. In 2006, a concerted effort was launched to publish as much information as possible about the texts, including new editions of the texts, as well as digital documentation, such as digital photographs. OI professor Matthew Stolper formed an international team of researchers and launched the Persepolis Fortification Archive Project, and this work is still ongoing. One segment of the Persepolis Project is concerned with producing a variety of digital images of these tablets. The images help the scholars read the texts, but will also serve as a record once the tablets are returned to Iran a process that is now underway, in fact. The Persepolis Project uses Ochre as a central database for integrating and analyzing its data. Ochre is a semi-structured item-based database. It was created as a data management environment for archeologists, but has since expanded to be used by a variety of humanities research projects around the world. Because the underlying data model in Ochre is based on items and not tables, these items can be integrated in creative and powerful ways. For the Persepolis project, the images and the text transliterations are integrated by means of a hot spotting feature. A scholar, or even a student, can draw a polygon around a cuneiform sign in an image and then associate this polygon with a single cuneiform sign from the text transliteration. Over the course of a decade, project workers have hotspotted over 110,000 cuneiform signs in the Persepolis tablet photos. The initial purpose of this hotspotting was to create something of a pedagogical tool to demonstrate to viewers the alignment of the text and the photo. So on the slide, you may be able to see that I've clicked on the sign MA in line eight, MA. The corresponding hotspot lights up in the image. So either by clicking on the text transliteration or on the image, a viewer can see the correlation displayed using these hotspots. What we didn't realize about these hotspots is that we were also creating a potential training set for a machine learning algorithm. It was only when we took a step back and surveyed the vast collection of hotspots that we realized its importance. Every polygon hotspot was associated with a cuneiform sign in a text. So for any given snippet, 
the ochre database could report the value of the sign in that picture. But even more importantly, the ochre database validates these signs against an internal sign list. You see, any given cuneiform sign may have multiple values. So in other words, the scribe would use the same arrangement of wedges to represent different syllabic or logographic values. In the ochre database, we document all the possible values of every cuneiform sign. This gives us then sign-by-sign -sign images of cuneiform characters connected to their values and texts. And all this for over 110,000 signs. And this is what we call our training set. The question then is, can this training set serve to teach a machine learning algorithm to recognize cuneiform signs and images such that in the future, the algorithm could perform the task on a new image without hotspots and even on a form of cuneiform writing from a different place or a different time. And so with that grand challenge, I now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Krishna. Thank you, thank you, Miller. Uh, now I will share my screen. Good. So that is a perfect starting, that's a perfect starting point for, uh, for our work when I, when I got involved in this project. It was the natural analogy between what we were seeing with this cuneiform, could a machine read, read these cuneiform tablets, and what we'd seen in computer vision, that optical character recognition had gotten really good. So just to understand where we are in computer vision, computer vision is a study of using computer software to analyze images and videos and more generally visual data. The problem of optical character recognition for the longest time was a classical benchmark in computer vision. You would get these handwritten digits, like the, like the ones on the left, and you would map them to, uh, you would map them to, their, true, to their true class. It would be the job of a computer to look at these handwritten digits and figure out what the most likely class was. So for, for the longest time, people worked on this problem. And over the last 10 years, we've seen leaps and bounds of progress in how accurate these systems have actually gotten. And in fact, today, uh, today these, these systems are about 99.84% accurate, which is insanely accurate. That's like one mistake in every 500, right? And if you just look at, if you just look at these, uh, these actual numbers that I've shown you, that eight in the lower right-hand corner, probably you might call that a four. That's your one out of 500th error over there. So in some sense, we've gotten optical character recognition in this kind of a restricted environment as good as human, humans reading these symbols. So how have we gotten here? So it's worth talking a little bit about the technology that has actually led us to get to this level of accuracy. The basic building block of these systems today is something called a convolutional neural network. And it's actually, it sounds really complicated. It sounds like some sort of fancy artificial intelligence, but it's actually based on a relatively simple principle. This, this operation that is called the convolution. What a convolution does is it takes an image, like something like the seven over here, and it runs a weighted average, a small weighted average called a filter all over this image and produces another image. You can, really think, you can really think of this as like dipping a little paintbrush in watercolor and averaging out the colors in a small neighborhood and producing a new image. Now you keep on doing this over and over again, rinsing and repeating until you lead to some sort of a mixed averaged image that is a much more, that's a less unwieldy form and more analyzable form than the original image, which might have a lot of nuance and a lot of, a lot of detail. And based on this final, final sort of compressed representation, you split, you, you make the determination of which class this image falls into. So a convolutional neural network really should be thought about as a sequence of these basic filtered averaging problems. We average things over and over again until we reach a final representation that we can analyze. Now, of course, it would be really hard for a human to go through and figure out how to exactly design these filters to make these classifications work. So we train these models by providing them examples of what they should be predicting. Right when you start off, a randomly initialized network, a, rand a network with these randomly initialized filters is probably going to make the wrong decision, right? It might call the seven a six. But if we have the corresponding image and its actual label, we can actually use that to update the network. We can say that, well, you predicted a six, you really should have predicted a seven. There's going to be some quantification of how wrong your prediction was. And then we can do a step called back propagation where we go filter by filter and filter and adjust it so that that 
that error metric goes lower and lower and lower. We can do the same thing with an eight. We can do the same thing over and over and over again until this network gets better and better and better at predicting, predicting these numbers. So that's exactly what happens. And in fact, the same principle, the same principle of image detection can be extended to much more unstructured scenes like the one on the right, where you have a bunch of cars out in the real world and you want to be able to classify different objects. The same basic architecture works across these different scenarios. So the convolutional build network is the building block of object detection and object recognition in today's computer vision pipelines. And that's really where we started. That's really where we started with the, uh, the, with the DeepScar project. Our idea was, could we take a basic convolutional neural network architecture, in our case, ResNet 50, and apply it to the training data set in the Ochre database with that, exact same, with that exact same process? We have the image, we know what we should be getting, we run it through the network, we compare it to the predicted versus actual, we backpropagate, and we keep on going image by image by image, updating this network over and over again. And interestingly enough, this process gets us to about 80% accuracy, which was amazing to us. This was just like right off the bat, just using standard computer vision and machine learning techniques, we got to about 80% accuracy. But that's actually not good enough. There's a lot of, there are a lot of hidden, hidden nuances in, into this accuracy metric that I'll, I'll, I'll dig into, but that was our basic first result that got us really excited about the promise of using machine learning for this problem. The first issue is, we see that this data is definitely not as clean as that MNIST data. While there were some ambiguous numbers like that eight that I pointed out in the MNIST data, it is nowhere, it is much, much, much cleaner than the data set that we're working with, right? For example, these two symbols are exactly the same. Due to different lighting conditions, due to different exposures, different, due to different cropping, sometimes the, 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 symbol, the, the symbol in the data might not be human legible. Another interesting problem is the issue of skew. The most popular symbol shows up like 42,000 times and many rare symbols show up with less than 50 instances. This type of skew leads to all sorts of issues in terms of accuracy, right? For example, that 80% accuracy, if you, if, you dig, if you dig deeper, symbols that show up less frequently, like for example, we, we did a simplified problem where we looked at just three symbols, one of them showing up about a thousand times and one of them, and the, 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 the least frequent one showing up about 800 times, we show that the, the network sort of biases itself towards predicting the most frequent symbols better. And this makes total sense, right? The way that we're training these networks is we're showing them examples and examples and examples and trying to get their prediction error lower. Now, if you, if you were a betting network, you would bet on the ones that are the most, the, the most frequent, right? That's how you reduce, that's how you reduce your uh, expected error the most. That's exactly what happens over here. We see that the actual accuracy among the least frequent symbols is much, much lower, right? So which, which means that that 80% is a little bit misleading. We're just predicting the popular symbols, which show up a lot, a lot very frequently. Now, so th this, this sets up the challenges that we're going to study going forward. And really, the, it breaks down into two things. The first thing that we're going to have to use is we're going to have to use methods to detect when these examples are illegible figure out how to actually tell the computer that this is not something that you should have been trying to read because we're not even sure if a human could read this. So that's going to require using classical computer vision techniques based on geometric understanding of these problems to see are there clear edges, are there clear shadows, how can this, how can this, how can this image be fixed? That creates a natural feedback loop to, uh, to augment our data collection. Maybe we have to go back to the tablets and retake certain pictures. The other interesting thing that we've actually been working on, and this is kind of a neat little, neat little almost computer vision contribution, is we've realized that to deal with the, the combination of illegible examples and the data skew, we can actually cast this problem rather than thinking about it as, as a classification problem, thinking about this as a pairwise comparison problem. Can we take the same network architecture and rather than figuring out which, which class is it, which symbol is it, can we just compare two, uh, two different images and say, do they come from the same symbol? What this allows us to do is we can build up a dictionary of known exemplars, symbols that we know are legible, so in those images that we know that are clear and compare new symbols against these. This greatly helps us with the skew problem because we've already built our dictionary of exemplars and it's simply a comparison with each one of these exemplars. 
And in fact, we have initial evidence to suggest that this pairwise classification greatly improves accuracy, at least in the simplified three symbol setting, where we can definitely hedge against some of the issues that we see with the rare symbols. So this is really promising and there's going to be, the future work is obviously to extend this to the entire data set and there'll be interesting questions whether these insights actually scale. Now going forward, this is really what we're, what, what, what we're interested in doing. How do we make this from this 80% accurate, it kind of works on the popular symbols, to something that is actually useful for humans? There are going to be many different techniques that we can use. The first, the first obvious one to do is to use surrounding symbols as context to improve predictions, right? Letters don't happen in a vacuum. There are neighboring letters, and that changes the probabilities of, uh, of what we should be predicting and what we should not be predicting. That's a huge prior that we can leverage. The other thing that we're thinking about doing is different types of pre-processing and denoising techniques. And the initial evidence suggests that that actually is a very valuable step, cleaning up this data before, uh, before feeding it into a network. But I actually think that it's easy to get stuck and uh, fixated on this as a form of automation. We're not simply automating. There are actually some really, really rich computer vision questions that, uh, that come out with this project. And in particular, one of the questions that I am really, really excited about this is do computer vision models, say trained on optical character recognition for, for, for the Arabic numerals, actually have some structure that is similar to the networks that we train to detect uh, the, to detect these uh, cuneiform symbols, right? That actually tells us that these networks are learning common structure that is common to scripts that are thousands and thousands of years apart. This would be super, super cool from a basic science perspective, right? And I think that is the, that is, I, I feel like the most exciting part about the DeepScribe project that together the computer science department and the Oriental Institute, we can really come up with new fundamental questions about both archaeology, but also computer vision as well. So this, this is what I think is really, really exciting uh, going forward. So uh, we received some questions in advance uh, to, to ask you guys. Uh, I have two questions here from Satej Soman. Uh, I'll ask one and then have you respond and then ask the second one uh, when you're finished. Uh, so the first question he asks uh, is, uh, given that Sumerian cuneiform was used for several other languages as well, uh, can the model you're developing be adapted to other languages? And what would you need to do to adapt it to, to, to additional archaeological uses? Yeah, that's sort of the ideal that we're hoping to be able to achieve. I mean, cuneiform has like a 3,000 year lifespan for many, many different languages. It's just a writing system, like the Latin writing system is used for multiple languages. Cuneiform is used for multiple languages. And the the tricky part is that between the different languages, there are different values that the scribes would use. So there's a different inventory of values for different languages. And then over time, the script evolves and looks very different. Um, but uh, so that's sort of the background of the problem, but maybe Sanjay can address what is the difficulty of going from Elamite, which is a very particular type of handwriting, quite honestly, one of the messier types, to something that's uh, where the wedges are arranged just a little bit differently. So I, I, th I, think that's a, I think that's a great question because I think it also gets to the heart about what our system is doing and what it's not doing, right? I feel like there's nothing in our algorithm that is actually understanding the underlying language. It is simply recognizing patterns. So if we have a pattern recognizer that works on one language, given the same amount of data and given the same quality of data, there's actually no reason to believe it would not do anything on the other language. That almost shouldn't be seen as a strength. It's kind of a weakness that it's just matching patterns, right? That's what <laughs> it's doing. Uh, great, and then Satesh's other question is, uh, how does the date of the individual source text affect the model? So in some languages, character frequency distributions change over time. Uh, do you see that in this corpus and does the model correct for it? Well, as I mentioned, the, each sort of period of the languages that use cuneiform have a specific inventory and those change over time. I wouldn't think that would affect our model, though. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I think that skew definitely matters. Now, if the, uh, if the skew, if, if something that is extremely prevalent in one era becomes not prevalent in another era, that would definitely affect it. Like, uh, but we, but what, what we found, if, what we found is that skew, the models are sensitive to skew. This mm. pairwise technique looks promising at, at 
at least to, to deal with that, but we don't know if that's going to actually work on the whole data set. So we're doing a simplified, just looking at three of these symbols and one is skewed and one is not. So Yeah, that's interesting because the inventory of values for Elamite is very different than from, you know, languages older and further west, more of the core of the sort of the Akkadian Babylonian dialects where plural markers are going to be very common because anytime you have a plural noun, it's going to end in a certain type of syllable. That doesn't really occur in the Elamite corpus of values because it's a different language and the plurals use a different uh, sign. So that's a very good point. So there'll be a, a much different skew in the different uh, dialects. So that'll be something to keep in mind, yeah. Great. Uh, Rob, should I jump in with a couple questions? Yeah, go ahead with a question, Nick. Great. Um, th that was very interesting. Thanks. Thanks to you both. Uh, I, I had a, a couple questions. I guess maybe since there were two parts to the method, I, m I might ask just a, a, a question on each. So um, one was, you know, with the sort of, um, you know, problems with Ill illegibility, and you talked a little bit about denoising and things. Immediately, too, I was thinking about signal processing and in particular image processing. And when you talked about like these, you know, um, rough edges, I was immediately thinking about edge detection, sharpening. Uh, you mentioned denoising. And it would seem that like there's a bunch of sort of established techniques there that, that you might try. But I was actually thinking, you know, have you have you sort of thought about the range of things in the toolbox that might be useful there? Because it seems like, as you point out, pre-processing might be the answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, the short answer is like, yeah, we are, we, are, we are exploring all of it. And I think we are actually probably going beyond edge detection. And I think we actually think that we can segment out the contours first and at the least, even if we can't do much with that pre-processed signal, it might be able to say that the contours are not legible at all in this image. So let's just throw a, let's short circuit the classifier and throw a question mark and then interpolate using context, right? Because if you know the neighboring letters, maybe that'll give you some insight onto the, uh, onto the uh, details. Now, one of the interesting things is our latest experiments have actually shown that uh, if you make your neural network big enough, somehow the network is even detecting these really illegible examples, which we don't completely understand why, how, what, what weak information it's picking up on. <laughs> that, that, that was the latest email update on the project. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a good future work question. <laughs> cool. Um, so my other, my other uh, question was on, on the other, um, the, the, what you were calling skew. It reminded me a lot of just sort of general problems in with imbalanced data sets, and um, uh, of course, like the, the the standard neural net training isn't going to necessarily always do very well on that. But like other kinds of models um, are better, at, you know, various kinds of ensemble methods, for example, random forest and other things. It can be better at at sort of uh, dealing with imbalanced data sets. And I was wondering if you know. You could think about basically, you know, decoupling the representation of, of your image or data from the model yeah. itself and then trying other things besides CNNs or maybe doing convolution uh, and then using that as an input to a different kind of model that deals better with imbalance. Of course, I, I, I think that it's, it's possible that an auto encode, using an auto encoder to represent the images first uh, and, then, uh, and then feeding it into another model might, might be better. We've actually, this, this pairwise comparison, there are, I think we see that as like a reasonable approach to this because at the least like we can, uh, we can say that these are, I think that ex comparing to exemplars, we found that, see, that that seems to improve the accuracy quite a bit. Uh, I, I think that the, the, question, the question that we still have is that will this work at the scale of the whole data set? And I think that's, that, that's where maybe, maybe doing an unsupervised learning first where we cluster them or we, uh, or we use some sort of an autoencoder or some sort, of, some sort of a representation learning technique first. Uh, is probably a good step. That's actually where I think that the most interesting computer science problem is because if you, does an autoencoder that encodes cuneiform script ultimately look similar to an autoencoder that represents uh, 
digit classification? And is there any way to make them similar, right? And like that's that to me is actually kind of an interesting question. Yeah, that's 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 a really interesting question. Thanks. Uh, just one more question from me. Uh, so one thing that's different about Cuneiform from you know, printed script as we know it today is that it has this three-dimensional quality uh, due to how it's actually uh, written into the tablet. Uh, so does that pose extra challenges for the model or does it actually create sort of interesting potential for how this model could be applied outside of decoding tablets to other sort of three-dimensional uses? I think, well, I mean, I, I think like I'll answer the first part and I think the next part is probably a better, better question for Miller. I think the short answer is it poses, it definitely does pose a problem for the model because it is a true, even though there's three dimensional information, you're getting only a two dimensional slice of it with a photograph, right? So the shadows, the, the particular shadows actually matter a lot, right? You could probably definitely construct a lighting scenario where the shadows are different. And it's possible that if you took the same tablets under different lighting scenarios, the network may not even predict them the same way, just because it somehow picked up on signals that are in the in the particular way that the uh, the, the images were in the training data set. Uh, now, I think a better question for Miller is what they do in practice and what kind of imaging techniques they they're interested in pursuing. Right, the images that we're using now are what you can think of as just conventional digital photography with one camera on a static arm with a light source that the photographer adjusts until they get the image to look like they want and then they snap the photo and it's done one picture and those are the images that have been hot spotted but the Persepolis project also has another entire category of photos um, called PTM or RTI both are good three letter abbreviations. It's just a type of photograph where you have a camera in a fixed position and then you take a series of photographs under different types of lighting or different angles of lighting and then essentially stitch those images together into one sort of virtual image that allows the user to virtually move the light source to any location, not just the places where the lighting was for the original images, but to all of the gaps in between where those lights were. So I point that out to say that we have two other types of images. One, for any given tablet pose, we have this set of 32 different light sources for that same tablet. So, you know, if we could feed those 32 images to the algorithm, it would see the same wedges from 32 different angles. And then we also have this finished file that has all of the virtual light sources uh, embedded in it. Now, I don't know of any way currently to sort of feed that sort of file to an algorithm and let it make all of the adjustments until it magically decides what the <laughs> sign is. But the potential is there to see those cuneiform wedges from any different lighting angle. So it, that's maybe sort of a 2.0 or 3.0 version of this project is that once we get beyond needing the hotspots as sort of the crutch that we're looking at and we can just feed it an entire image. Can we feed it a stack of 32 images representing 32 different light angles of that very same wedge? And that to me would seem like it would really increase the chances of the algorithm recognizing a sign. Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. I think all of those problems are super, super interesting. And I think what's, what's most interesting is this is the, like playing around with the light sources is really the only way you're going to get that three-dimensional information, right? Because the, the actual 3D features are kind of small on the tablet relative to the sizes of the lenses. So it's, it's <laughs> like, um, like lighting is really the tool that you have at your disposal. That's right. I mean, it's worth pointing out that any given cuneiform sign is maybe two millimeters high, you know, and sometimes smaller, and sometimes it's one wedge, sometimes it's a series of six wedges. So, you know, two millimeters with six wedges all on top of each other is a very detailed piece. And so far, 3D scanning and 3D modeling is not quite to the level of being able to capture that type of detail, at least as of this recording, shall we say. <laughs> Great, well, Nick, go ahead and uh, wrap us up. Great. Uh, well, thanks again to, to Miller and, and Sanjay for a really interesting uh, talk. 
um, in, in the first of our data dispatches series. Um, I found that fascinating. I, it was really interesting to learn about some of the work going on at the, at the OI. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that after nine months here, I still haven't visited and it's not gonna happen in the next month or so, unfortunately. But um, after this, I'm really excited to get over there and, and, uh, and pay a visit. And uh, I have to say that was a fantastic explanation of, of ConvNets, one of the one of the more clear that I've seen. So, and and seeing it applied in this context was really exciting. So, thank you both for for such a clear and exciting presentation. And I I, I think Rob, I'll, I'll turn it back to you because I think we've got another data dispatch coming up soon, and and maybe we want to let people know about that. Yeah, so we'll be posting these throughout spring quarter. Uh, you can uh, find it on our YouTube channel or go to our website at cdac.uchicago.edu uh, for more information about upcoming talks and to see videos of these talks uh, approximately once a week this spring. Thank you all for watching and attending. <laughs>